Welcome to The Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Dr. Sally Sattel. Dr. Sattel is a visiting professor of psychiatry at Columbia University's Vagalos College of Physicians and Surgeons, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine, and a practicing psychiatrist. He specializes in addictions. She holds an MD from Brown University and completed her residency in psychiatry at Yale University. Patel is the author of PCMD, How Political Correctness is Corrupting Medicine, Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience, which she co-authored with the late Scott Lilienfeld, and One Nation Under Therapy, How the Helping Culture is Eroding Self-Reliance with Christina Hoff Summers. Dr. Sattel lives in Washington, D.C. So I triggered this conversation uh, beyond just that I'm a big fan of her writings and works and have been reading her and watching her uh, lectures and so forth and media appearances for decades. She's really great. Is a article she just wrote for Quillette called What is Happening to My Profession? The profession being uh, psychiatry in particular and medicine in general. In particular, and I read a portions of this in the podcast, but let me just read this again from this. Uh, her concern is this that was just released in October of 2021 from the American Medical Association, a 54-page document titled Advancing Health Equity, a Guide to Language, Narrative, and Concepts. The guide condemns several dominant narratives in medicine. One is the narrative of individualism, and its misbegotten corollary, the notion that health is a personal responsibility. A more equitable narrative, the guide instructs, would, quote, expose the political roots of underlying apparently natural economic arrangements, such as property rights, market conditions, gentrification, oligopolies, and low wage rates, close quote. The dominant narrative says the AMA, quote, create harm, undermine public health and the advancement of health equity. They must be named, disrupted, and corrected. So, and this goes on and on, so you can, I recommend reading the article. I'll provide a link in the show notes. But what's wrong with that? Well, you'll see we discuss that at, at great length. And we talk about, in general, the kind of woke social justice movement. We do try to understand it and steel man their arguments, particularly in the realm of medicine. In psychiatry, her specialty, but in education, more in general, because she's also concerned about uh, medical education, that, that is, education of medical students, and how this um, this indoctrination has been happening across the board here for a couple of years now, actually for a couple of decades now, but getting worse. So we talk a lot about that, but also talk about her specialty on addictions, drug addictions in particular. She spent a year in Ohio studying the deaths of despair, and to what extent pharmaceutical companies responsible or the sales people that pitch these drugs or the physicians that prescribe these drugs or the drug takers themselves. How do you tease apart those, those different uh, levels of responsibility? And that leads us to talk about agency in general. To what extent can we control our behaviors, particularly when degrees of freedom are greatly reduced due to addictions and what that even means. What does it mean to be addicted to Facebook compared to addicted to opioids? Um, then we talk about uh, to what extent you can apply market solutions to medical problems. Her specialty is organ transplants. Sally herself is the recipient of two kidneys. And, um, and, and what a disastrous system that is at the moment. 100,000 people need them. Maybe 10,000 get them. Maybe 20,000. Anyway, it's a severely in shortage. And uh, is there a way to, to solve that problem? There is, and she outlines that in great detail, as well as just talks about a lot of her own background, how she got into psychiatry, and to what extent we can understand the cause of psychoses, and like schizophrenia, some of the others, uh, manic depression, severe, uh, severe depression, and so forth. So this is a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. And as always, if you appreciate the podcast, please do Support us at skeptic.com slash donate. Okay, thanks for listening. Sally Sattel, nice to see you. I'm a longtime fan, first-time first caller, longtime listener. <laughs> uh, 
as they say on Rush Limbaugh show. Uh, you, um, I will have already given a, a proper introduction to the video, and in the show notes, we'll have your bio and links to your books and and all that stuff. But uh, you know what triggered this was this. Um, well, I mean, I've, I've I've long wanted to talk to you anyway, but you wrote this piece in Quillette recently. What is happening to my profession? Uh, yes. Your profession being medicine and psychiatry in particular. And uh, I, I will remind uh, listeners in this conversation that 20 years ago, you wrote a book called PCMD, How Political Correctness is Corrupting Medicine. You were worried about this two decades ago. <laughs> and uh, so, so I guess a, a, a good place to start is, is uh, you know, give us a little bit of background about you, as I don't know much about you personally and where you grew up and how you where you did your medical training, why psychiatry, how you got involved in, in some activist uh, uh, activity and and then all the way up to this uh, that book and this article. What's happened in your in your lifetime? OK, it's funny. I never I never say I'm an activist. I always say I'm a reactivist because oh, like there's just yes, there's just so much. Um, uh, uh, insanity to, re as I say this as a psychiatrist, to respond to. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, and I'm a, certainly a fan, a longtime fan of yours. Uh, I've gotten Skeptical Inquirer for a long time. Um, so I I'm the other up, one. Well, I'm, uh, I'm the other one. We're, we're this one. <laughs> skeptic. Yeah, I know skeptic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. People um, confuse them. It's all right. <laughs> no, we, not, we like them. Right. We're friends. We're friends. We're all, um, all good. So I grew up in uh, Queens, New York, and um, my parents were uh, weren't prof professionals. My dad was a, a cameraman, and um, my mom was a housewife, and went to college at Cornell, thought I was going to be an evolutionary biologist, uh, went to, spent uh, two summers, I think it was three summers in Ithaca, New York, all around um, you know, the Great Lakes area. One year I chased salamanders. Uh, my professor was interested in um, uh, amphibian navigation and homing behavior. And his theory was, uh, he was partial to the polarized light theory. So we tracked um, salamanders through the woods. And, um, and then I also spent an another summer working for a, um, here's a, a $10 word, myrmecologist. Uh, an hmm, expert in ants, the ant oh, expert, oh, okay. ant spiritualist, right. yeah. And um, that, that wasn't that exciting. It, I was mostly uh, pinning them in display cases. Uh, but in any case, so then I went to the University of Chicago to get a, a PhD in um, evolutionary biology, and I, I absolutely loved it there. But my first year, I, you know, it's funny, this is a story I've only within the last few years felt comfortable talking about, but, um, you know, what the heck, I've talked about all my medical problems before with the yeah, kidney transplant, yeah. so um, I let it rip now. But um, so when I started uh, my first year, I, um, I, I got a, a, an infection and um, I was started on uh, steroids for that infection, very, and, and they're, you know, prednisone is just an excellent uh, anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, so the dose was fairly high. I'm not, I'm kind of a smallish person. So 60 milligrams was, is, is a pretty substantial dose. And it was very effective in dealing with the inflammation. But it also, after being on it for about two weeks, I started, um, frankly, losing my mind which is, if people are familiar with that medication, and especially if they are have ever been on high doses, um, that might not sound so strange because a lot of people will talk about feeling very energetic, you know, uh, almost manic. And in fact, there was a, a classic, I think 1952 story in The New Yorker by Burton Ruscha. I don't know if you remember him, but he was a famous medical detective. I think he was trained as a toxicologist. And, um, and he'd have stories in The New Yorker every, um, you know, a few years or a few months uh, talking about some mysterious uh, case of um, one was a, the blue policeman. I think there was a cyanide problem. And he would, you know, it was a forensic kind of analysis. It was really fascinating stuff. And he wrote one was called 10 Feet Tall. And it was about a man who was put on very high dose steroids for an inflammatory condition of, of the arteries. 
and he became psychotic and uh, and manic. So, and, you know, in cross section, he looked like a classic, um, you know, bipolar patient in a manic phase. Um, and typically, uh, these uh, mental status changes, as they're called, re- remit when the doses are are lowered. Um, but uh, I didn't know what was happening, and my um, uh, reaction to it was not to get uh, hyper and manic but to get like, profoundly depressed, um, really qualitatively different kind of, I mean, I, I'm sure, um, you know, we've all been really low at some points, uh, but this was incredibly, um, it was very different. It was a, um, you know, profound kind of hollowness and yet a, an agitation and steroids do often cause anxiety themselves. So you felt, felt like my organs were kind of shifting and my body and um, uh, when you gain weight, you, you are ravenously hungry. And uh, I remember I would walk through Hyde Park um, without any real destination, almost aimless. It was a, it was it was a such a disembodied kind of experience. But the worst part of it was that I be, I developed a, a receptive aphasia. Um, most people are maybe familiar with expressive aphasias. Uh, well, basically, an aphasia is a language problem, neurologic problem. Oh, um, right. Typically, you see it with strokes, and a receptive aphasia is a person can't. They, you can ask them a question, and they will understand the question. But they really can't respond, and I mean, it's not as if their mus, you know, oral musculature doesn't work. But they cannot respond in a coherent way. Um, but receptive aphasia is, in a way, the mirror image of that, and it, it obviously hits a somewhat different part of the um, language and uh, center, and um, and that uh, is manifest by not understanding what people are, are um, what you what people are saying to you, or what you're reading. And uh, this was the first quarter or first half uh, of the, my first year, so the first semester. Um, and uh, yeah, there was obviously a ton of reading. It was a lot of work and a lot of memorization. So we remember we were doing paleontology at the time, and I couldn't mem- I couldn't memorize anything. I was effectively demented, you know. And I also couldn't understand when people talked to me. And I remember also trying to read. Um, I was reading the word. Um, I was looking at a newspaper and there was a carpet sale. And I remember thinking, why would anyone need a, a pet for a car? What's a car pet? I didn't get it. I didn't get a lot of that. Whoa. So thank Whoa. God I had wonderful. It was really weird. Uh, I And very rare. I've since found out um, not so much the mood changes and the anxiety, but the um, these virtual, you know, well, they're all neuro- neurological and fundamentally, but um but the aphasia was quite quite rare. So I had wonderful um, uh, advisor at um, the University of Chicago, and the department was great. And they said, "Oh my gosh, take 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 as much time as you need it." So it only took about six weeks because, as you know, you cannot s- stop steroids um, if you've been on them for any amount of time, even even sometimes over ten a week to ten days. They have to be tapered because they've already suppressed your adrenal glands. And if you stop it abruptly, then you will have effectively have a Cushing's type syndrome where you have very low level of um, norepinephrine and you, can go, you could even go into a coma if you were on high doses and abruptly stopped or if you lost your adrenal glands. So, you know, it took a long time to come off it. Um, but bottom line is once I did, I re- resumed my baseline functioning, except what wasn't baseline, it was my career aspirations, because at that point, I wanted to become a psychiatrist, because clearly there are people who go through, you know, versions of these kinds of transformations, and they they can't attribute it to some exogenous substance they took, and they can't count on it ending when they stop that substance, in my case, uh, steroid. And uh, so it took a while, but uh, I ended up applying to medical school, and I went to, um, I actually did two years at the University of Chicago, switched to Brown, and, uh, but I knew I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I think most people go to medical school um, not knowing exactly what kind of doctor they want to be, but I knew I wanted to be a psychiatrist, and worked with some excellent um, folks at, at Brown, and then I did my residency at Yale, and um, and that's when I uh, I was always interested in um, psychosis, um, 
because of the experience I had. I mean, I didn't have hallucinations or delusions, which is kind of the classic psychotic experiences. But um, but I just was I was so uh, um, impressed, so uh, staggered by how how a chemical can change a brain. Um, certainly, uh, people bef- for you know centuries before me uh, came to that realization, but. To experience it myself, and to really not have given it much thought before, was was really uh, it was groundbreaking for me. So it obviously is what I changed my career, and um, so I wanted to go into um, I wanted to work with people who were schizophrenic, but uh, since I wanted to stay at Yale, which is where I did my residency, I was basically told where I had to work, and that was on a substance abuse treatment unit, um, and I wasn't that excited about it, except that this was the mid, early to mid-80s, 1984, and crack cocaine had just about come to New Haven. And I think I'm the only one to see an upside in crack cocaine because it gave me my research projects, which was uh, substance-induced psychosis. Um, there was an assumption that cocaine would act very much like amphetamine, did in the fifth when it was very heavily used in the 50s and 60s and caused amphetamine psychoses, which in a cross section looked very much, they were actually was considered a model psychosis. Uh, um, amphetamines were considered to, to generate model psychoses with delusions and, you know, bizarre thinking and hallucinations and visual and auditory hallucinations. And there was a thought that crack would do that as well. So this was my back doorway into studying psychosis. And, and I did start that research. And it turned out that, that, that uh, cocaine, and even in crack form, mainly if it induces anything, and it's usually at high doses, it's, it's a kind of paranoia that that's, has a reality, um, a realistic component to it. So in other words, you're very you're very paranoid that the police are after you or that somebody's calling the police are going to get you in trouble because you're using crack. Um, I, I once, uh, one patient told me that this was, and this was the most bizarre um, hallucination I've, I, or, or delusion that I was, t- that I heard of, which is that the police were on the ledge of his building and he lived in a high rise. So that was bizarre, but mostly it was this paranoia and it kind of cleared the next day. But anyway, so I wrote that up, and I was one of the first people to, not the only one, but one of the first people to describe the phenomenology of that. So anyway, I'll speed it up. But um, so there oh, I was at the West good. Haven. This is great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the West Haven VA. And because um, there were two things, you know, treating um kind of tended to rotate running various units. So I did run the substance abuse treatment unit. Then I um, was on a general unit, I think. And I think I was on a PTSD unit. I have, my memory's a little shaky about that. Um, but I became interested in, um, in two main things. And uh, one s- still had to do with addiction. And it was, um, it was uh, what even then struck me as a very... Um, kind of naive view that we could cure addiction with a medication or some sort of pharmaceutical intervention. And as you, uh, you know, methadone has been around, methadone in particular has been around since, um, we used in the United States since this, the mid sixties as replacement it was used for detox before that, but used as a replacement drug. Uh, for for opioid, mostly heroin users, for a long time, and it's it's a very I work in methadone clinics, and it's a very very good drug, but but rarely is that enough to you know it gets cured with methadone. But it's 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 essential often for stabilizing people, and you have to be stabilized before you can start to repair things and change your life. So I have nothing against medications, but you know we must have tested. By now, at least over 20 medications for cocaine have been tried, and nothing's worked. Um, I don't fault anyone for, for uh, you know, uh, trying to, um, uh, to use these medications. That's not the problem. It's uh, just the point, A, that none of them has worked. That's, that's just an empirical fact. But that even when we were doing some of these um, clinical trials, that I, I, there always was among um, the folks I, I know I worked with, 
a, a, um, a hope that it would be enough, that the medication would be enough. And frankly, that's often a manifestation. Anyone who would tell you that is someone who really doesn't know much about addiction because um, there's the physiological and you know biological components of addiction. And mm. then there are the existential, and those are profound, and no pill treats that. Um, so, uh, and then there's a lot of behavioral, a lot of, you know, Pavlovian cues and a lot of behavioral dimensions to it that, uh, you know, they can be addressed. We have very good treatments for that. But anyway, I was getting very disillusioned with this, um, almost a, uh, conveyor belt. Well, we'll try this drug. We'll try that drug next, you know, next. And NIDA was the National Institute on Drug Abuse was very enthusiastic about this and, and, and the money kept rolling in, but, um, it was nothing to show for it. And again, I thought the enthusiasm was misplaced and, and, you know, kind of naive. So, you know, that was just something that disillusioned me a little bit. Um, and the second thing was the culture of the VA hospitals. Um, I think VAs that are associated with major medical centers probably give good care. I mean, you often hear horror stories about VAs, but, um, but, you know, the one associated with Yale, I think, gave very good care. And I'm sure the one at Stanford gives great care and you can go on and on. So it wasn't that the care wasn't good. It was that the disability system created uh, such profoundly perverse incentives for patients to stay sick. Um, and we were dealing mostly with people who had PTSD. They were Vietnam era vets. And um, the PTSD itself, now remember, I'm talking the early 80s. And PTSD itself um, was officially recognized by the American Psychiatric Association and the DSM, the Diagnostical Statistical Manual, like, you know, our Bible, in 1980. So this was all new, although the phenomenon, of course, has been documented, you know, the Peloponnesian War. I mean, and what is the essence of PTSD is effectively a, a fear response that hasn't extinguished when the threat goes away. Uh, and so its classic symptoms, of course, are, you know, anxiety and re-experiencing the traumatic event in the form of unbidden memories and, uh, um, and, and nightmares and, uh, and also kind of the third, uh, the third general set of symptoms is uh, an aversion to situations that remind you of the trauma. So if you were in a horrible car accident conceivably, it might take you three years before you'd ever be willing to drive again or be a passenger in a car. Um, all very understandable. And we have good treatments for these, um, mostly behavioral. But um, in any case, but once you get money for being sick, that's a problem. And also, we had, um, there was a culture of, of uh, understanding PTSD at the time, which has changed in the VA for sure. But at the time, there was a sense that it was almost um, permanent, that you weren't just changed by your war experience, but you were irreparably damaged by it. Now, some people are damaged. Almost everyone has changed. It's hard to imagine anyone who's not changed. But most people are not in, irre in an irreparable state. And I mean psychologically, physically. And yet that was a message they often got. And they were quickly encouraged to apply for disability. So um, they were effectively told, you're not getting better and here's your check. And so that took folks out of the workforce and work is the best therapy for anybody. You know, it, at the very least it distracts you. Um, it gives you something to do. Um, it's a social network. It's a good model for your kids. And um, the more you stay home, you get into this uh, cycle of invalidism where whatever skills you had erode and your confidence atrophies, and then you'll never go back to work. And so many of these guys were rehabilitatable, but they were so quickly inducted into this disability system that, um, frankly, it was, it was just terrible. Um, and the VA has a strange uh, habit that they haven't yet fixed which is that they will grant you disability. Now, I'm all for people having some kind of financial support until they get them, themselves, you know, uh, where they are ready to work or work in some capacity. But um, you can apply for, for disability insurance. Or not insurance. It's called service connection, disability entitlement. 
before you've ever been in treatment. So that's like saying, the analogy to me is, you know, I've been in a car accident and, um, you know, I can't walk. And someone comes, knocks on my hospital door and says, brings me a wheelchair and says, this is your wheelchair forever. And here's your check because you're not going to walk again. And, you know, I'm saying, well, wait, I haven't had surgery. I haven't had physical therapy. Why are you, con- you know, consigning me to this? But, uh, you know, these poor guys and women are so free. You're in such a fragile state that it's, it's easy and so suggestible that it's easy to uh, really incorporate this image of yourself, your capacities and your future. Anyway, to watch that up close was very difficult. Um, and there's one other thing we did the VA, and I'll let it get you worded edgewise after this, is um, that disability money. And I saw this when I ran the drug treatment unit. Well, guess what? If you have a drug problem, what are you going to use your VA benefits on? You're going to buy drugs with it. So um, every month, you know, that's the checks came out every month. And then, the, and then we'd get more patients in, you know, right after that because they'd buy cocaine, uh, alcohol, whatever, and then they'd come in and uh, there was actually, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine by a colleague of mine who, who actually tracked the cycles of this. And, um, but it was so destructive. It was like uh, what I, I call social iatrogenesis as opposed to, um, iatrogenesis is a word for basically an unintended consequence of treatment. So it's a fancy word for side effects. But this was like social iatrogenesis that actually getting a well-intended benefit, and everyone is well-intended. I never doubted that for a minute here. Um, but it actually made folks worse. If they were people with schizophrenia and they use cocaine, their symptoms would get worse. People tend to get, who already are depressed, may get suicidal while they're crashing from cocaine. And um, uh, clearly, then it wasn't going to their rent and their expenses and all the things it should go to. So there was more domestic you know, discord and violence. So I got really interested in these issues of disability policy. So I decided to do a health policy fellowship. And I did that in 93, 94. It was called Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship and went to Washington to do that. And I've, I've been here since. And you're still at, at associated with Yale. So, but, but surely since this has been going on for so long, somebody in the VA or somebody like you would say, we need to reform the, the uh, system to change the incentives. So you'll get a check for six months or until your doctor says you have to go back to work or whatever. I mean, there must be some reform movement. No? <laughs> uh, the VA lobby, the veterans lobby is incredibly powerful. Mm. And even though this is all, uh, I, I think I can make a great case. I think all my colleagues or our group of us who, uh, and I'm sure many people I don't even know who are trying to ch- try to change the system. I've, uh, you know, been at hearings and um, and written a lot about this. Um, I mean, the first thing I would do is not make anyone eligible for disability until they've been in a treatment first, for heaven's sakes, and you know, give them all kinds of different messages. Um, and then, um, it, you know, you want to front load. In, in some ways, you want to front load the money. I mean, put a ton of money into rehab. Uh, as I said, support people while they're going through that rehab. Some of it might even be inpatient, although you want to, you as, as much as you can, you always want to keep a person in their community and with their family. But if they have to be inpatient for a while, that's fine. And, and get to a point where um, service-connected benefits are so rare that when a bunch of guys at the VA are in the waiting room, you know, waiting to see the doc, and um, they're talking about what's wrong with them and you know, how the VA is treating them and all this. And one guy says, well, uh, you know, my disability check is late or or I just got my disability check. And they all look at him and say, oh, you're on disability. Wow. You, gee, you must, you know, you, you must be, uh, have, be having a real hard time because I want the system to be so oriented to to getting people back. Um, And there are all kinds of employment opportunities for people who, of course, who are, you know, do have, uh, you know, impairments and I can tell you that the short answer, um, Michael, is no. Uh, there's an excellent book that for anyone interested in this issue should should read. It just came out. Um, I, re- I reviewed it. Uh, it's called, it's a great title. It's called Wounding Warriors, 
Wounding Warriors, um, I wish I knew the subtitle off the top of my head, but how the VA, something, it says how the VA administration, I think, makes, patient, makes veterans sicker and something like that. And it's written by um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Daniel Gade. And uh, he's actually was in, uh, I think, Afghanistan and, um, and lost, a, lost a leg of the enormous rehab efforts, but uh, uh, he's doing well. In fact, he ran for governor in, um, uh, was it senator, excuse me, he ran for senator in Virginia, and uh, he did lose, but, uh, to, but he, he really made a good showing. Anyway, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy, and this book walks through everything and in a highly compassionate way about the veteran system and how to fix it. And what's especially remarkable about the book is they got a lot of, somehow he, he got a lot of people who still worked at the VA and dealt with the service connection bureaucracy to talk to him on the record. Um, it's a great book and he's a great guy. So that's worth reading. But the short answer to your question is no, it's not changed. Um, the only thing that's changed yeah. is they try to get the vets out of the hospital um, we kept them in the hospital and they would like recreate platoons. And sometimes they, they'd all run out on a mission and it was just regressive, you know? Wow. <laughs> Sounds kind That's of comical, wild. but. <laughs> That's pretty wild. Yes. Well, this is the incentive problem for any government program. The moment you start giving out free checks, uh, the demand, it's the supply and demand problem. The demand will always outstrip the supply. And then the government bureaucracy has to continue to grow to meet the so-called demands. And yet, of course, they're well-intentioned. There are people that need help. There are people that are uh, down on their luck or out of work or alcoholics or drug addicted. They're homeless. They, you know, they just, you know, had a, a number of things that happened to them that were not their fault. I mean, just bad luck. So, of course, we want a safety net. But, you know, the, the, then it starts growing. And if you look at the numbers, uh, it's like 20 percent of GDP for most Western democracies. Uh, goes to, uh, you know, um, uh, transfers, wealth transfers for various social programs. And we're not that much uh, uh, less than most Northern European countries. We're pretty close to Canada, actually. <laughs> so for all our, you know, conservatives complaining about this uh, and liberals wanting to do more, uh, it it still say, stays pretty locked in at about 20 percent. And, you know, I, I have no idea how to <laughs> reform it because it, it it is such a huge, massive uh, incentive to keep it going and the lobbyists and so on. But let me shift to a, a different subject. So uh, determining causality in medicine and psychiatry. So in your personal example, that was pretty easy. It's a single vector, one variable. It's the prednisone. You know, you take it, boom, you have these, you know, psychotic effects. You stop it, boom, it goes away. Okay, that's a no-brainer. That launched your career. Obviously, uh, physiology and, and neurochemistry, all this stuff, this is what's causing these symptoms. But the moment you shift away from the simple example like that to something far more complex like schizophrenia, say, uh, and, and then, as you said, you get on the treadmill of, of just trying drug after drug after drug. It's like that scene in Awakenings where Robin Williams plays the Oliver Sacks character where he keeps trying and trying and trying different uh, doses and different combinations. and so do you think it's, is it just a, a really hard problem to solve and we're on the right track? We just have to find the right combination of, of medicines or, or, or different new ones that are going to be developed by big pharma, or are we completely off the wrong track? Like maybe the shift from 19th century electric shock and, and early 20th century lobotomies to 1950s, 60s, we're going to do... Uh, chemical treatments, uh, medications, and that was a huge uh, step forward. Maybe we need something completely different that I, I can't even think of what that would be. Uh, or do we just need to keep hammering away at, at, at the algorithm to find the right combination? You guys, funny you mentioned ECT, um, electroconvulsive therapy, because that happens to be an excellent therapy for severe depression. I, I would want it in a minute. I mean, if, really? if the problem I oh, had wow. didn't resolve, yep, yep. If the problem that I that I had was, um, you know, we'd call an endogenous depression, so to speak. That word isn't used that more, but it's it's it's, it's perfectly um, or, or organic. It's called an organic depression. And not, what it, what that means is pretty much the way you described it. You can, you could attribute it to um, 
some kind of discrete intervention. In my case, it was a drug. Another organic effect could be tra head trauma. Um, yes, I mean, of course, it has a terrible reputation that still hasn't shaken from, you know, the one floor of the cuckoo's net days. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> net days. Um, right. But yeah. uh, I've gotten much better at it. They even do ambulatory ECT for people who are uh, well enough to leave the hospital but still need um, either um, sessions to continue the treatment or to maintain, uh, you know, their recovery, so to speak. And um, and that's not used enough, oddly. But I I think of um, sometimes I think maybe the one of the more productive ways to think about mental illness is the distinction between, as if any distinction is ever clean, but um, on a continuum between what I guess a philosopher of science would call natural kinds versus interactive kinds. Um, a natural kind um, would tend to be more like schizophrenia, so what we would call the severe mental illnesses, um, bipolar illness, severe OCD, um, panic. Um, these conditions uh, often respond very well to medications. It's true that people with, uh, they have side effects, unfortunately, a lot of these medications, really, really bad ones. Like, um, um, I mean, when you're a, let's say you're a young person, you're having your first psychosis. Oh, I should add, that's a, that is one very, very optimistic thing is that um, there is something called first episode psychosis, as his name implies, um, and even what some doctors are calling a kind of prodromal psychosis, where they think they're seeing the very, very early onset. And if you intervene uh, during the first episode or symptoms that appear to have a very good likelihood of foreshadowing a florid episode, you can really start to arrest these. Um, and I think that's one of the most exciting developments, frankly, in, in schizophrenia. But... Um, but when you do have to go on the medication, sometimes it can cause a lot of weight gain, which, you know, you're a young per I mean, it's, that's bad enough for anybody. And it's bad physiologically and diabetes is a complication. But, you know, you're already, your life is such incredible flux if you're a young person. And that's when these symptoms start to emerge in your late teens, early 20s. And like the last thing you need if you're trying to socialize is to feel worse about your self-image. Um, but uh, but some, and sometimes they don't contain the symptoms enough. So yes, they're always um, you know there are active uh, drug um, development programs, but the pipeline is pretty is running pretty dry. And it might be interesting for you to have a psychopharmacologist on to understand why we feel like we are kind of bumping up against the limits. Uh, I can't talk to uh, much in depth about that, except to say that I have also known people for whom Prozac is been a lifesaver, um, and, uh, and the SSRIs in general have really helped with um, anxiety. Um, there are old drugs called monoamine oxidase inhibitors for depression, and we don't use them too much anymore because you have to watch your diet or you could have a hypertensive crisis and possibly even a stroke, but the diet yeah. isn't that hard to watch. And those drugs, you know, might be brought back for some patients. They can be very effective. Um, also, behavioral um, interventions, especially for panic and anxiety, uh, cognitive behavioral, those can be very effective. Uh, some people would argue that really the biggest problem is the access to care, even though, you know, a lot of the treatments could be better. At least they're certainly better than nothing. And a lot of people don't get them because the mental health system is a mess. It's disjointed. Um, coverage is crummy, frankly, I don't know if we're going to get to this during our time, but I'm very worried about the training that's going on now in, um, mental health, not so much in psychiatry, but in the mental health profession, um, the, the trends in, I'll just, I'll just use this word, forgive me, wokeness in, uh, medicine yes. that yep. I think are really distracting us from the true mission of what we're doing, um, but uh, but one might make the case that 
what we have to offer, even though it's less than perfect in many cases, is just not getting around enough. What, what do you mean not getting around? Oh, just not being available, uh, available oh, enough to oh, people in terms uh, of their, access, yeah, access, access to the care. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, so the wokeness thing, I mean, this brings us up to the, uh, your, your article in Quillette. You write here that the American Medical Association published this uh, document, Advancing Health Equity, a Guide to Language, Narrative, and Concepts. And here you write, the guide condemns several, quote, dominant narratives in medicine. One is the narrative of individualism and its misbegotten corollary, the notion that health is a personal responsibility. Uh, a more equitable narrative, the guide instructs, would, quote, expose the political roots underlying apparently natural economic arrangements, such as property rights, market conditions, gentrification, oligopolies, and low wage rates. What this is doing in a, a, a medical text or book is beyond me, but here we go. One form of correction that the AMA recommends is equity explicit language. Instead of individuals, doctors should say survivors. Instead of marginalized communities, they should say groups that are struggling against economic marginalization. We must, close quote, we must also be clear that people are not vulnerable. They are made vul vulnerable. Accordingly, we should replace the statement, low-income people have the highest level of coronary artery disease with people underpaid and forced into poverty as a result of banking policies, real estate developers, gentrifying neighborhoods and corporations, weakening the power of labor movements, among others, have the highest level of coronary artery disease. Close quote. Wow. I mean, this is really quite something to read. Obviously, this is triggered by the, the whole BLM movement, the social justice movement, and, and so forth. Understandable people are upset uh, when they watch these videos and, and they think, well, what can I do? I'm not a mayor of a city to reform the police. I'm not the, the chief of police. What can I, you know, I'm a, I'm a nobody. What can I, oh, I can, I can change the language in our form and I feel like I'm doing something to help the you know, cause. But as you point out in your article, you know, medical doctors are busy enough as it is and can't barely keep up with their own profession, especially if reading uh, journal articles. How are they also supposed to be political activists at the same time? So, wow, that's a lot that's changed in the last just probably five years. And you wrote that first book, PCMD, 20 years ago. So this has been a long trend. <laughs> yeah. Um... I, yeah, you have to read that. I mean, I'm sure people's ears glazed over just listening, but um, because it, otherwise people wouldn't believe it. This is an American Medical Association document that came out in October. And, uh, and frankly, it, in a way, it's almost late to uh, the developments that have been uh, going on. Uh, just to you know, a little bit of backdrop. Um, uh, when I wrote PCMD um, <laughs> like 20 years ago, I did have a chapter uh, on this, but in other words, on social justice and uh, I should say critical social justice. And I guess what I mean by that is the sort of that, you know, the dimension of equity. In other words, I, you know, these words are um, irritating, but you have to try to define them, even if your own definition may differ, at least just keep referring to your own definition. Um, which in my case, when I think of equity, I, I think of, um, uh, you know, a guarantee, not of trying to get, trying to guarantee, uh, which is difficult, uh, equal opportunity moving on to the guarantee of equal outcomes. And so, uh, which is even often harder and really distorts, distorts so many pictures. Um, so in other words, you would have, um, a difference in health outcomes. And this is very, this in fact is really one of the core concerns of the social justice movement. And it's a valid concern, which is uh, referred to as health disparities, which refers to differences um, in either access to care between groups. It's typically black and white, but not always, but that's the typical dichotomy. Um, or and or differences in um, differences in access to care, differences in treatment by doctors, and differences in outcomes, with the implication 
that systemic racism is the cause. Now, disparities, uh, like the word bias, like so many words, is a fine word. It means difference, differential. Um, it, it, it implies nothing about the etiology. And years ago, when the term disparities first started to be used in the thing in about the 80s, it was pretty neutral that way. It just meant this is a difference. We should look into it. Why is this? Um, and uh, But now it is really infused with a kind of uh, reflexive and axiomatic um, interpretation and a, a kind of malignant one. You know, this is due to systemic racism um, or, or even racism um, coming and emanating from the doctor alone, but, but, but more of an emphasis on, on systemic. And I want to get back to that because uh, you could make, you can make, um, construct a narrative where there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I mean, there are uh, certainly societal um, pressures and limits um, that have um, been ongoing for decades. Uh, they're getting better, but they have their residua, and, and those manifest in, in many ways economically, um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, career, you know, careers, in terms of um, wealth, in terms of housing, and why not in terms of health? So that, that's really not, um, that, that's really not, it's not necessarily illogical to say that. The question is, though, that we're, we're doctors. What am I, how is that actionable for us? What are we supposed to do about that? And that gets to what I consider the two most pernicious aspects of the social justice movement in, in medicine. One is, is a very overt um, directive for doctors to become activists themselves and not activists to get better health coverage or lower pharmaceutical prices or, uh, you know, more uh, harm reduction uh, if you, or if, you know, um, you know, clinics or more Narcan, not that, which I consider completely reasonable because those are proximate to health, but to go upstream, you know, really upstream to those, um, to those dynamics that you had mentioned earlier, uh, the property rights and market conditions and economic arrangements and low wage rates. And, and to that, um, you know, I'd say, well, why? We have no expertise in it. It's not even, as you said, that, hey, we already have a job, which is called treating and diagnosing people. Uh, well, in the reverse order, diagnosing and treating people. And even that, we don't have enough, uh, people have 15 minute meeting uh, visits with their doctors often, which is a, a, just a scandal. Um, but here there is a demand for us to, to examine something and, 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 and advocate for ch a change we, we don't, we're not, any, we're not experts in. So that is um, not only a waste of our time, but it's also an exploitation of our authority because, you know, doctors have respect by and large in the society. And to kind of put that math, we're doctors, so we know what to say about housing policy. It's absurd. Also, and this is the, probably the worst, is that it will erode the public trust in us. It will look as if we're a politicized profession. Uh, we already are very much a left of center position uh, profession at this point, which frankly is completely fine if people keep psychiatry their psychiatry is. I mean, there's been of, there's been surveys of psychiatrists yes. and they they oh, lean yes. left. Oh, oh, very much so. Yes, and in huh. certain professions, frankly, like mine, like pediatrics, well, public health, and oh, um, primary care, it's almost predominantly left, and especially in, in academic settings. Um, because doctors with more, you know, who are more interested in free market uh, tend to be maybe more libertarian or right of center um, will be in private practice. And those are the only doctors who will speak out against this. It's very rare to find an ac a doctor in an academic setting who will speak out against this. And I didn't even, we didn't even get to the what the this is in terms of how it manifests. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's one of the two prongs that are really problematic which is this uh, really changing the identity and the mission of the profession, that doctors should be activists outside of their profession in way, or in ways that are so 
removed from their profession, um, that, that everything becomes a health problem. You know, like bad housing is a health. Well, it is kind of a health problem. And I can understand, here's an example of where I do think it makes sense for doctors to a very much to study and to point out um, a health problem. Let's say um, you're a pediatrician and, and parents who live in a housing project nearby are constantly bringing their kids in with asthma attacks. And we know that um, allergens from roaches uh, are, exacerbate asthma. Well, that's... That, to me, gets close to medicine. You know, that I get, that I understand. Um, Again, I'm not saying doctors are going to, we don't know about housing policy, but we sure can point out that connection. And that correlation is important. And that's called, it has a formal name. It's it's, it's part of what's called the social determinants of health. And that's very, very important. We have to know all the, um, doctors should know more about a patient's context, their living situation. How do we know they can't refrigerate some medications that need it or that they live in a stable enough housing where they can even, you know, their medications aren't stolen or um, that they can even keep appointments or the child care, that all, that's important. Uh, that's where caseworkers and social workers come in, but that's very important for doctors to be more sensitive to that. And and that was an important um, change over the last 20 years, I think. But again, this kind of far upstream um, politicizing to me is, is just untenable. So that's the first of the two. The second is this um, an, an increasing um, emphasis, at least in theory, on the group as opposed to the individual. Well, you know, when you see a doctor, it's about you. Um, and psychiatry, where I work, is the ultimate personalized medicine, right? But um, it's about the patient. It's not my concern. I don't see you in a group context. I don't think of you in um, relation to other patients or as a white patient. I don't think of you compared to my black patients. You're Michael. You're my patient. And what's in your best interest? And you know, how do we talk? And what kind of relationship do we have? So these are two very, very un- unfortunate um, trends. I-, I have to say at this point, it's kind of an experiment. It's hard to know how it will affect patients because I, f- I find it very hard to believe that a-, a doctor who has the most fervent belief in the social impact, uh, all the impact of, of you know, environment and other kinds of, of dynamics on his patient who's diabetic will still not talk to that patient about, hey, you know, you still, you got to take care of yourself. There is, you know, there's an internal locus of control here too. And it has to do with, you know, taking your medications and watching your diet and some exercise. And let's talk about what impediments there might be to your doing that. But that's your responsibility. And this is one of the implications, if you take it to its natural extent, of this, of this emphasis on uh, people being uh, solely at the mercy of outside forces or their health being solely at the mercy of outside forces. Um, I was personally, <laughs> I can give you an example of, um, of, of why that, you know, why I worry about how that's going to manifest. Uh, I was giving um, a talk, in fact, it was um, last year on January 8th. Uh, that date is, is, is important. You will see why. Yeah, I was I love, giving I this, this um, talk yeah. at, uh, oh, at Yale, uh, my, my home institution, my old institution. By now, I think they're very annoyed with me. Um, and uh, so I gave this talk about my year. I spent a year in southern, uh, southeastern Ohio trying to do a little clinical work, helping with the opioid crisis and, um, and interviewing everybody who would talk to me. So that was 2018 to 2019. So I talked about what I called My Year Abroad. This was my title, My Year Abroad. Um, Ironton, Ohio, and some lessons from the opioid epidemic. And so it was pretty wide ranging. Um, It wasn't your classic grand round presentation. A lot of them are um, either very sober, they're very data heavy. um, They're often delivered in a a monotone, but that's okay. That's what people expect. And they're very informative. And, um, but I showed some, you know, slides from the year I, I was gone. None of them depicted any person uh, in distress or looking, um, um, you know, in, in a bad way. They were all of the environment, 
you know, of some industrial landscapes that had started had rusted, long rusted, but really desolate downtown, this kind of thing. And they talked about, you know, it was panoramic, the deaths of despair uh, concept. And, um, and uh, th then I did discuss more data on who gets addicted uh, because there are vulnerabilities to prescription opioid addiction. I parenthetically get a little worried that we've kind of exaggerated the extent to which the average person who's given a Percocet is on his way to a a full-blown addiction. It's actually quite rare in people who don't have a previous problem with uh, drugs or who are not experiencing uh, depression or anxiety. But but it's very important for doctors to screen for those things because that will increase the risk um, that uh, most people who do become uh, develop problems with these medications, um, as I mentioned, have. Um, uh, they'll have started with other drugs beforehand. So um, it's all important to know because you want to know the risk. I went through that. There's quite a bit of data on that. Then my, then I uh, hit the climax with, uh, you know, how um, the opioid crisis has so many, there's so many con contributing factors to it. And you can't just reduce it to a, a drug company that did some damn bad things, which again is, seems to be part of a narrative that's a little reductionist. And, um, and then I also talked about addiction itself, which I have um, spent a lot of time thinking about, and uh, the extent to which there are uh, dimensions of agency in addiction. And in fact, our whole job as psychiatrists is to tease those out and make them the dominant um, motif in one's um, life. And that's what's called recovery. So anyway, I finished the talk. And even though it was on Zoom, I knew that I could feel like wafts of cold air coming from the computer. It was bad. Um, and uh, so I was told that I dehumanized the people um, in this town. Uh, let's just put it this way. If you want to read more, you can read the Quillette article. Um, and you could even see the talk. But it was just very poorly um, reacted to, and in fact, apparently I re-traumatized them after January 6th that, mm -hmm. um, uh, because I was in somehow insensitive, which, you know, I mean, I made a lot of friends there, people that I, I, I'm still in touch with. I was so impressed about the people who are trying to boost the economy and the morale of this town. I mean, I just find it hard to believe that that affection for these folks didn't come through, but, um, uh, they thought the title was somehow offensive. It's othering my year abroad. Um, you know, I guess I can see that in a way, but as 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 it always goes with these kinds of I'm offended responses, well, maybe there are other meanings it could have. Like, you know, when people talk about their year abroad, it's generally an affectionate thing. You know, I had this experience, I learned something, it changed me, it was it was good. Um, or the irony of it, you know, we're all one country, but there are so many, you can go to different places. I'm a Jewish girl from Queens. What do I know from small town, you know, um, Ohio? <laughs> the town had like 10,000. Yeah, that, that was yeah. the most interesting thing to me at all, was small town dynamics. And, um, but anyway, but I guess I'm taking a long route here to say, going back to personal agency, one of the, one of the comments was pretty much how dare I attribute any, um, I guess, responsibility to the actual people who uh, went out of their way to obtain OxyContin and, you know, crush it up and snort it. And, um, well, you know, I feel I already cut covered that in my deaths of despair. I mean, this was largely a story, as it's so much of um, America uh, lately, of defeated people in defeated places. And this was a communal response to a very depressing situation. So I certainly put it in context, but I also know that these people have choices. And frankly, that's a choice. Who knows? Maybe I'd make it if I lived there. I don't know. But, um, but that was a f the whole idea that, um, that everything is not attributable to, you know, external conditions is a very worrisome one, because, and especially in psychiatry, because... Um, you know, nine-tenths of what we do, if we're not dealing with flat-out symptom relief, in other words, psychosis or depression that's so bad you can't get out of bed, is um, helping people uh, 
try to make different choices because they're the first ones to tell you, I think I'm making the wrong ones. Um, so, you know, we help people who suspect they're sabotaging themselves. Sometimes we have to point it out. You know, that's not really what you say your goal is. Why would you do this if that's your goal? Let's think about that. Um, and in some cases, if the situation really is unchangeable, and this is a very stoical approach, but it's adapting to certain situations that can be changed, but there are always more, there are probably better than, ways to adapt than others. So anyway, this is, but this is very much part of, of a horrible trend. Um, I was, uh, it, the chairman was told to, to fire me. Um, I don't get paid. I'm a, I'm a lecturer, so I don't mean to paint myself as some endangered horror. And there have been horror stories of people who've lost jobs in academia because of this. Uh, I wouldn't have suffered that way, but my whole experience was just a biopsy into this, um, you know, really into the pathology of what's going on in um, medical, uh, frankly, education, which is something I wanted to get into, if that's okay, very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just one comment. Um, I think that the two, I think the two yeah. threads you're you're identifying there in the let's just call it the woke social justice movement uh, is uh, identifying everybody as a member of a group, and one group is uh, a, an oppressor, and the other one's oppressed. This is usually black and white, and and then the lack of uh, agency, since you're not an individual anymore anyway, you're just a member of a group. You shift even the language just to read that. Uh, that part again, instead of, instead right. of you're individuals, you're a survivor, you've been made vulnerable. Yeah. instead of, uh, you're struggling against economic marginalization, you were, uh, it, you, it, this was put upon you by these racist, uh, bigoted system systemic systems. So it does, it kind of taps a deep, this deep issue of free will and determinism. Obviously there are degrees of freedom. So like in your work on addiction, you make the point that, uh, clearly, this is not like you have schizophrenia or you have dementia and and you can just will it away. You can't. But with addiction, you can. Lots of people do. And thanks to psychiatrists like you that work on it, lots of people pull themselves out and somehow or another. It's obviously it's possible to do. Uh, not for everybody. So there's degrees of, of freedom in there. And uh, but this new system seems to just want to wipe all of that away. I call this, it's, this is not my phrase, but I apply it here, the bigotry of low expectations. You know, you're just so helpless. Yes. You're so pathetic. You have no chance of succeeding. None. Now, good luck. Go on out into the world. The world is hard enough as it is, right? And uh, and, and it's not to deny that these these things exist. They do. Uh, you know, racism and misogyny. And so I'm sure you must have experienced some of this as a woman in psychiatry decades ago. Maybe there were, you know, men that didn't, feel you should be there. Maybe there were systemic issues or whatever. Uh, but that has been changing, has it not? I mean, and maybe just comment on that, how, how your own profession has changed and become more tolerant and open, I, I presume. Oh, yeah. Actually, so I've been pretty lucky. I, I never felt um, that I was uh, on the on the receiving end of, I mean, occasionally the very, you know, the very the older, you know, we were talking maybe not two generations removed, you know, a psychiatrist in his 80s who call your little lady or yeah, whatever. It's trivial. And whatever. But no, but I think other people would, would have stories. I just am lucky enough to, to not have one for you. But I, I don't mean to imply that no one does and it's not a, an issue. But no, if anything, now psychiatry, I think, is dominated by women. And, um, and we are so, um, we are so attentive to um, real and perceived trauma in my profession, <laughs> that in, um, in some schools they are still having weekly, um, you know, when the pandemic started, it was very stressful. And if you worked in a hospital, which I d didn't, I mean, the stress is just fear that you might be, sick, you know, catch it with bad enough, but enormous workloads and the uncertainty and the Granted, uh, very stressful. So there were, um, they'd have sessions once a week for people to, uh, you know, vent. Um, but th there's this expectation also, and I think that's healthy, and that's fine, and we should be able to. And that's a change, because I think in the old days, it would have been suck it up. Um, where I kind of wonder about it is 
why are those still going on? I still get those emails, you know, about these these sessions. Uh, but uh, in other words, no, I think um, I actually think there's a, a lot of sensitivity in my profession. Um, in some ways, I think um, in some places, I know I'm being a little vague and there's no need to give um, the name of places. I'll just say that in some arenas, I think there's frankly too much accommodation for um, uh for well, frankly, for the frankly, the residents that complained about me, they sent this uh, letter, of course, anonymous, right? It read like a parody um, yes, of these yes. kinds of letters. <laughs> but the the extent to which, and I felt I feel sorry for the administration because um, you never know how many people are complaining. You know, if they're the tip of the if they're a tip of an iceberg or the far end of a bell curve, you just never know how many. But we do know that they have outsized influence. And uh, the, the, the scramble to accommodate these folks, I really give the chairman a ton of credit for, for uh, not rescinding my appointment because I'm sure he was under a lot of pressure and I'm sure some other chairman might have. So, you know, good for him. But um, uh, so if anything, I sometimes think this pendulum has gone in kind of the other direction to accommodate gonna, so much of this. Anxiety. I was going to point out one of my favorite books by Thomas Sowell is The Quest for Cosmic Justice. And there's right. this idea that if, unless all people are equal in outcome, especially groups, then that has to be adjusted perfectly across the board, everywhere, all groups. You know, you end up with a Lake Wobegon where everybody is above average. Everybody has to be good looking and smart and so forth. And that's just not the way it is. And then if you add the group element to it, as Sol points out, you can take any two groups anywhere of any kind, and they're not going to be equal across the board. They're just not. That's just not how it, it works. And uh, so I, one of my early Substack columns here, I, I published this uh, data set of doctoral degrees by field and gender. So the ones that got a lot of play, this was in response to one of these Scientific American kind of woke articles. Uh, that women are underrepresented in doctoral uh, degrees in engineering, math and comp, computer sciences, physical and earth sciences, and business. So those four got all, were the attention of this entire article. Uh, but they failed to, to report the others. Uh, women were, had a majority in biological agricultural sciences, arts and humanities, social behavioral sciences. I'm just going up the scale here. Yeah, no, Education, I... 68%. Health and medical sciences, 71% of doctorates earned by public administration, 73.6%. Only 26% of men earn doctorates in public administration. Only 29% in health and medical sciences. So why isn't anybody asking what's the, uh, what's the systemic bias against males in graduate school that prevents them from earning that perfect 50% of graduate degrees in those fields. Of course, no one cares, right? Because that's not, right. you know, the, the, the narrative. I know, I know. And and you, when you mentioned uh, equity, uh, in other words, trying to guarantee outcomes, I mean, there have been, I, I feel uh, like I, I, I want to give some more examples about, I mean, I think the AMA document was horrifying enough, but you know, I could see people saying, well, it's just a document, you know, and I know what the AMA, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm positive that I'm right when I say, look, they hired some company to come in, uh, you know, some very DEI company, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, heavy, uh, you know, group of consultants. They wrote this. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the really senior people at the AMA were horrified and embarrassed. I have no, in, I do not know this, but I wouldn't be surprised. But what do you, now you can't not release it. That would be more of a scandal. So they're stuck with this thing. Um, it's, and you might think, well, who cares? Yes, it's, it's kind of appalling. And it's at the very least, if I were an AMA, a dues paying AMA member, I'd be pretty darn upset. This is what they do with my dues. Um, but, um, and then say, well, th and then that's the end with, but it's not the end of it. And so I want to show how it's really has started to really, um, impact at least medical education and other, uh, kinds of, um, other kinds of activities. So, so here's an example, equity related, um, when, um, back in March, 
of 2020 when we were afraid that we'd run out of ventilators, that we'd need ventilators and run out of ventilators. There was uh, some serious discussion. It didn't prevail, but among uh, bioethicists and, and some uh, medical, some doctors, that in the allocation of limited resources, that uh, am among the, the, the various, um, uh, what's the right word, criteria that would be used to, to determine uh, who would get the ventilator, which is typically, uh, it's, you know, in triage, it's generally who's salvageable. Um, not if, you know, you may be sicker than me, but if you're so sick, you're going to die. We're not going to waste a ventilator, frankly, an organ, which is an issue I'm very interested in, organ rationing, um, having gotten two tr kidney transplants. And, um, uh, you know, but, but some, kind of, uh, some kind of measure that has to do with uh, um, health and, and prognosis. But, but there was serious consideration of adding race as one, you know, to basically give you an extra point. Often there are points systems for these kind of things, which vulner, how many vulnerabilities, how many uh, indicators of, of um, illness there are and compromise. And, and seriously think of adding race to that. Well, that did not happen. Um, at least we didn't have to even confront it because thankfully we never had to ration ventilators. But it came up again um, around last December, I mean, the December of 2020 when the vaccine came out. And there it was much more seriously entertained by an advisory group to the CDC that race um, would be a factor, all things being equal, it, to a black and white individual with as much risk of um, becoming um, either becoming ill or spreading it, which are really the probably the, one of the, some of the two main reasons you'd want to be vaccinated, people who are at higher risk for catching it, and if they caught it, to become quite ill, and people who are at higher risk for spreading it to others, hence the healthcare people, would, always first on everyone's list. Nobody, nobody challenged that. But again, there was this idea. And in the spirit, it was very um, overtly stated, in the spirit of reparations, that minorities would get a leg up. Now, Given the risk factors that many minorities sustain, in other words, they often ha would have jobs. This is economically related in large part, but still, um, but they might have jobs where they did have to face the public and they did have to take public transportation and they did live in homes that were everyone didn't have their own room where they could close the door. It could well be that minorities would be uh, prioritized, but you base it on risk factor, not on identity factor. And uh, but that was shot down, but it's back up with Paxlo with Paxlovid, uh, which yeah, is the antiviral for um, Omicron. So um, so that's um, one um, manifestation of this um, about, uh, again, an equity kind of solution that is just um, I, I mean, we can debate reparations, but in the realm of health, there are there are metrics and there are, um, you know, objective uh, ways in which we decide who gets scarce resources. And again, uh, identity, qua identity is not, is not one of them. Um, so that's, that's one manifestation. We've seen cancellations, uh, very high profile cancellations. Um, uh, uh, the, what the highest profile one was, a cardiologist who had written a paper, and a peer-reviewed peer paper in the Journal of the American Heart Association, um, where he was, he was critical of affirmative action. He reviewed the literature quite meticulously. I reviewed it a long time ago for PCMD. Um, interestingly, it's hard to get current data, which makes one wonder if the Association of American Medical Colleges might not want this um, certain data really? out. But um, but it but there are data that show that you know minorities, you know, all but is it lower scores and take longer to graduate or you know um, this kind of thing uh, performance measures um, just based on you know the classic problems with affirmative action sometimes that they all well meaning stipulate again but but um, pushing under under prepared people to do things that um, you know they're not ready to do yet. 
And uh, but the, whatever the reason, the, the raw data showed that um, you know um, there just wasn't that level of performance. So he concluded that um, you know affirmative action is not healthy for cardiology in particular. And um, and it was it was well written, as I said, it was peer reviewed, and the conflagration that um, ensued was on Twitter, as you can imagine, was profane in parts and and a highly um, just to savage the, the guy and uh, his his university, which was the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, refused to let him consequently uh, subsequently have contact with uh, residents or fellows or medical students because he was so unsafe. Not my word. Um, he was stripped of his stripped of his directorship of the electrophysiology fellowship, cardiac. Electrophysiology is quantum physics, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, this man was so talented. And in fact, he got excellent reviews as a teacher and as a clinician. I don't know if you ever go on Yelp uh, and look up, not Yelp, what's it called? Well, whatever the doctor equivalent of Yelp is. I mean, you might see a few, you know, responses under doctor's name. This guy had over a hundred. Very impressive. All fours and fives. Um, so now he's deprived or his would-be students are deprived of his clinical wisdom, and his paper, of course, was retracted. Um, I, they, they subsequently wrote two papers uh, kind of explaining what, I'll just take my word for it, they didn't point up any errors in his, um, any significant errors, into the, and they could have been letters to the editor, you know, or they could have been an invited response. But in any case, he's suing, and um, I'm, I'm oh, glad he wow. is. Good. Yeah. Good. That could turn things um, so around. Could, lawsuits could, lawsuits could turn things yeah, they around. Get when, people attention. Are de- when people are defamed, when their uh, livelihood is curtailed or or destroyed, they should fight back. I mean, that that'll that could turn the tide. I am worried about this. I mean, the, I, I I keep thinking the pendulum is going to swing the other way. I, I, I talk about my wife on this podcast coming here from Germany seven years ago now, twenty uh, four. Yeah, that's right. Seven uh, going on eight years. And, uh, you know, we, I keep telling her, don't worry, this is going to, I've, I've, I'm old enough to remember that pendulum swinging back and forth. This is going to turn around any month now. And I've been saying that ever since it seems to be getting worse. Your latest piece is like, oh my God, this is now infiltrating psychiatry. All right. That's not good. Education, you know, all this stuff is, is still ongoing. And, uh, you know, it's enough to say, I understand why people are upset, of course, but I just don't see this is the solution. This Kind of race essentialism, uh, or maybe even gender essentialism. I don't. Or maybe it would be the opposite there. But in any case, that you know, the most important thing I can know about you is how much melanin you have in your skin. I'm I'm, I'm picturing you know a Julius Stryker, a Himmler type person with one of these uh, skin tone charts that the Nazis used to use to to you know judge races uh, when you come in to get your vaccine. Well, let's see if you know you you if you make the criteria for. For it being high priority or not, how much melanin you have in your skin? This is crazy. Uh, this is, you know, th- this is what we've been fighting against for centuries to stop doing that. And um, you know, people don't want to be told stop doing that because this is the common narrative. So here is a, a full page ad in Friday's Wall Street Journal. Uh, here it says, "Dear white parents," and this is uh, promoting a film short called. DearWhiteParents.Guide. So you can look this up and watch it. It's a three-minute film. And basically, it's the anti-racism movement. Uh, They have a lot of funding now to buy a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal, I guess, tens of thousands of dollars. And this isn't like talk to your teenagers or your your kids that are in their early 20s. These are kids that are like five, six, seven years old in this film. And they're talking to them about, you know, racism and slavery and bigotry and and you know this is all good for you know maybe age appropriate classes in history anthropology sociology political science or something like this yes i don't think we should bury our our past but you know to what extent does a five-year i have a five-year-old now i have a 30-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son so the idea of planting in his little brain he doesn't think about right he wouldn't have no idea what i'm talking about and and we have black people here uh, he just doesn't think about it. But now I got to sit him down. Okay, here, this is a really super important thing. 
the color of that guy's skin. This is really important. And people used to think this was, you know, they were inferior, but now we know they're not. And now this is rattling around in his head and he's got to be hes thinking about this. How can that possibly get us to the point where the color of your skin doesn't make any difference at all? I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter. I'm not even thinking about it. And I don't So again, I understand why people want to do it. They're upset. Uh, but to me, it feels like we're moving in the wrong direction for the, the arc of the moral universe, you know, judge, judge by the content of your character, not the color of your skin. Okay. I'm ranting, but uh, I, so how do we turn this around? You give me your, your thoughts. On this. Oh, for a five-year-old, <laughs> just have him play with as many different kids as imaginable. So, no, <laughs> yeah. um, no, no. I, I mean think, the cultural I trend. No, I no, what, what, that's yeah. appropriate. Yeah, but I'm very right, yeah. um, pessimistic about medicine, to be honest. Um, um, you know, you it's hard to talk. Um, well, you can't talk about. Uh, it, it's. I mean, there are people still looking at genetics. And and how certain um, you know genetic components of of certain conditions uh, by race. Now everybody knows the race races do not have discrete different genetic uh, 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 you know they're not genetically different, uh, but there uh, are of course. Uh, different frequencies of of genes, different frequencies of alleles that will be more common in certain groups. Well, I should even say in s- certain people, depending on their uh, geographic ancestry. And it's just this would be like sickle cell anemia. It's just population genetics. Yeah, sickle cell anemia. Yeah, so that is. Yeah, and it's not that's not that's a Mediterranean thing. So it's not even limited to to African American. I mean, Greek people have a high. So when you trace it back to um, uh, ancestry of uh, heritage and and geography, you know, you get the answer uh, to to and often there is a almost a biological like why you know because of mosquitoes in that in the case of sickle cell, but um, or maybe some dietary thing or. or um, or maybe just some. You, well, I didn't speculate. I'm, I'm not a. Um, I'm not a geneticist. But the point is that there are. There are again, and these are um, heavier concentrations of certain genes that do certain things that have physiological manifestations that may make us sick. And um, in fact, there was a, a study that. Um, I mean, all these things need to be replicated. But that found a certain protein that was more common in African Americans that. That uh, line the, um, uh, I think it lined the pharyngeal um, and maybe upper respiratory tract that did make uh, uh, did did cause the vax the the virus to adhere more um, tenaciously. Well, that's worth knowing, and and yet uh, the the again the pushback on that has been um, very very really just ignorant because again it's just population genetics. And um, and uh, and no, and it's right. such a so straw quit- man to say there are genetic right. differences between right. races. Well, no one's saying that. Um, well, anyway, po- that's again that's another I, manifestation. I, I, I prefer the term population rather than race, but we're just so race obsessed in this country, it's hard right. to change the language at all. Um, yeah, so let's talk about a few other things that we'll we'll shift the lightning round now since we're coming up on okay. an hour and a half here shortly because <laughs> there's so many things that I'm interested in that uh, I know you've thought a lot about. Uh, so, but, you know, just back kind of on the free will determinism issue related to say addiction and diseases or criminality or, you know, to what extent do people have volition they should be held accountable? Or maybe you could even say the opiate crisis since you uh, studied that, you know, to what extent does the Sackler family and big pharma it should be held accountable for this. What about the doctors that wrote the prescriptions? What about the salesmen that pitched the doctors? What about the people that take the drugs? I mean, they, no one's holding a gun to their head. So, you know, how do you tease apart uh, moral culpability and responsibility and agency, something like that, or addictions in general? Well, my answer to that is yes. Every, every you know, there's enough blame to go around. The only difference is the the folks who became addicted um, uh, won't be 
held accountable in the same ways, and they shouldn't be, <laughs> in the same ways, uh, you know, through the criminal justice system. I mean, unless they were large scale distributor, you know, dealers. Um, uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, uh, you know, there was, uh, that they played a role too, but more in the spirit of trying to understand why they, why, why they, took the drugs. Now we talked earlier about, um, uh, you know, by now it's a little bit of a cliche, but it's still a profound one, which is the, which is people who live in communities that, uh, where they appear to see no real future, uh, for themselves that are economically depressed, um, that have now are now maybe third and fourth generation, uh, in households where this has been the case. So uh, I've had, prob- you know, troubled parenting. I mean, when a, when a factory first closed down and the dad lost his job and started drinking too much, all the dad needed was a job, and that fixed it. And now that's often not it anymore when it gets so many generations down because kids have been uh, thrown off their trajectory so early, and the schools are so awful in so many of these places. In fact, in the town I was in, well, actually, Ohio had, um, in general, published a report card of the educational system, C's and D's for schools on various measures. I mean, you you know, you can easily start to see that people don't even have a sometimes a chance. Um, but we know that addiction. <clears throat> I mean, people call addiction a disease. Scott Lilienfeld, my dear Scott, <clears throat> brilliant, brilliant psychologist who died about a year ago. Um, we wrote a book together called um, Brainwash, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Yeah, I love that book. And one yeah. chapter, thank you, was on addiction. And, um, and we're really critical of the brain disease model, which is very common. Uh, it's, I mean, in fact, people don't blink now. It's almost, it's almost like a key on the typewriter. Addiction is a brain disease. And uh, I mean, of course, of course, drugs change the brain. And of course, addiction is a... Um, is neurological components to it. But the way we looked at it um, was, well, that's just one of several explanatory levels. You can explain addiction at the level of the brain. You can also explain addiction at the level of, of conditioned behavior. You can explain addiction at the level of psychological behavior. Um, you can explain addiction at the level of the community. Uh, you know, you, there are, you could explain it maybe in cult, of, uh, cultural. Uh, there are just so many... And uh, some apply more to various pe- individuals than others. Some may apply more or less over the course of an individual's addiction. Um, but, the one, but, the, but the brain level is the one that is least useful to treaters and to policymakers. And as far as, and they, you know, they've showed beautiful brain scans. And, and I, I certainly do bow down before the technology it's it's breathtaking uh, not just the actual pictures but the whole the whole um, um, mechanisms are, are amazing but they are highly seductive they lead to uh, in, they inevitably lead to a reductionist view oh you know here it is in the brain well no you know this is some activity we can see we can visualize it but again not one tree I'm going to say not one treatment has ever emerged from that, um, which is not a reason to say we shouldn't be pursuing imaging. Yes, it has all virtues, but as far as when it comes to, to addiction, every medication we used was developed, I think the last one that we still we're using today was developed in 1980. Nothing is new. Wow. Um, wow. And uh, so I think, and I personally think of as, find it useful to think of addiction more as a kind of a symptom than a disease, in other words, which gets you to think about why, what, what, what function does do drug use serve? Because it always serves a function for people. Now, for some people, it's more of, I, I think in terms of communal addiction versus sort of individual addiction, people who live, who basically are, are in situations that are, they feel are so hopeless that they kind of, there's no choice. And those who are, um, but if they were in a different situation, they like they could flourish, versus those who 
those who are frankly are people we know who are, are, are half the probably folks in Hollywood, people who are beautiful, people who are rich, people who are talented, people who seem to have or admired, who would seem to have everything to live for. And yet, you know, they have drug problems. Well, you know, there you get into whatever their particular situation is, whatever, whatever their personal, you know, deeper anguish is when you read addiction memoirs that 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 thing and there's never almost one there's never one thing but the dominant driver is often uh, a kind of self self-loathing that people tend you know can kind of soothe or even um cause them to you know forget it's not for it's not gnawing at them all the time uh with with drugs so um so i think is of that, that self-medication as, um, Yes, you can call that self-medication. Um, Anthony Bourdain, uh, you know, he had a significant drug problem at one point. And when he was asked about it, he did one of his um, shows on uh, Parts Unknown in it was 2014. He did it in uh, rural Massachusetts, which had a huge drug um, uh, prescription pill problem. And um, he was doing a little, frankly, he visited a group of people who were in a support group. So everyone kind of went around the room and talked about how they got involved with drugs. And, and he said something that was just so resonant um, uh, that I used it as a title for a a paper, but he said, um, I really hesitate to call what I had. And he was referring to his first heroin and then cocaine at crack addiction. I hesitate to call it a disease. Um, it was more like there was a dark genie inside me. And I, I, just, I just thought that was so, I mean, it's so metaphor. It's so poetic. It's so beautiful. But, but that kind of, it kind of inspired me to think of sort of dark genie addictions, which is to say one where the person is, where the pain is in the person versus dark horizon addictions where the pain is outside, you know, where the community is sick. Oh, interesting. Uh, and um, anyway, so... So that's so basically calling addiction a brain disease. Sure, of course, addiction changes the brain and drugs do, but you're shortchanging this process. It's so rich. It's be looked at in so many dimensions. Why are you doing that? And it, it leads to a, a naive view of medications being the cure. Um, and it also is um, when we think of disease, you could say this is a problem with calling it a disease anyway, but I think the brain disease is really problematic because it kind of reifies it. But when you think of a disease, you think of something that's involuntary, that it happened to you. Um, You get pneumonia, you could be in a coma, and I could give you antibiotics and you can get better. You don't have to participate in your getting better at all. But in addiction, if you don't participate, you'll never get better. And um, I also, uh, if you got um, a real brain disease, like a brain tumor or Parkinson's, um, I could not use or Alzheimer's, that's, that's my usual example. If I said to you in the early phases of Alzheimer's, I'll give you a million dollars if your memory doesn't, det- if you can keep your memory from deteriorating, you know, here's a million dollars. Um, but if you fail, I may have to shoot your dog. That wouldn't matter. We use contingencies with people who have drug problems all the time and things called drug courts. Uh, we'll erase your charges if you, for example, give clean, you know, urines or complete this program. Um, we like in our clinic and methadone clinic, we you can have more take home doses, so you don't have to come every day to the clinic if you can give us, you know, fill in the blank, whatever. These are contingent. This is contingency management, which is c- incredibly powerful and incidentally probably the only thing that works well with stimulant addiction. So, um, but, um, so yes, there are changes, brain changes in addiction, but they're not the kind of brain changes that make a person immune to, uh, sanctions and incentives. And that's key because we can use that. Including self, uh, incentives. You can, you know, control your own behavior, changing your future self. That is adjust the incentives for your future self to behave differently based on what's going on at the moment. That's how I think of getting volition that we live in a determined universe. Yes. But, but we're aware yeah. of the causal vectors and, and I can adjust 
future Shermer tomorrow. I know what I'm going to be like tomorrow morning when it's early and I don't want to get up. So I'm going to set my workout clothes out ahead of time because I know I'm going to be weak willed in the morning. So I want to make it as easy as I can for myself. Now on the addiction, a couple thoughts on that. I like the medical medicalization of it in the sense that, and you talk about this in your books, that it's not just a willpower thing. Oh, he's weak, you know, or, or, or that kind of biblical, you know, you're just a sinner and, and, and you're weak willed and with Jesus or with uh, Tony Robbins or with the right uh, a mantra, you can, you know, will yourself out of this addiction. Clearly, that's not correct. But on the other hand, uh, I don't like this medicalization of addiction to things like Facebook, social media. Oh, I'm addicted to Facebook. Oh, come on. <laughs> this can't be the same as alcohol or, or uh, the op- opioid crisis or I'm addicted to porn or gambling, you know, so here it's so social. I mean, how do you know if you're addicted? Well, if your spouse leaves you and you lose your job, you probably have a problem. Whether you call it an addiction or not, it's probably not the right word. Uh, or I remember uh, listening, you probably know who Dr. Laura is, Dr. Laura Schlesinger, the radio yeah. psychologist. Yeah. So, um, you know, she had this call-in show. And, and, uh, and so one time somebody called and said, I'm addicted to porn. I just cannot not watch porn. I got to watch porn. She goes, are you watching porn right now? He goes, well, no, of course not. I'm talking to you. And she says, well, do you watch porn at work? No, I can't watch porn at work. I mean, I'd get fired. Oh, so apparently you can not watch porn. Oh, huh. yeah. But I, I thought I was, ad- okay. And then, you know, kind of, what does that even mean to be addicted? You know, so. Yeah, and, uh, I wish people and would I, almost I, stop using that word. Yes, I know. I've, I've ranted about this on this show many times, but that, pot, that, that Netflix documentary, The Social network, you know, which they had these guys from ex programmers from Facebook and other companies, you know, uh, self-flagellating as if they were J. Robert Oppenheimer that had just invented nuclear weapons. And now they're sorry they created the like button on Facebook. I don't know. To me, maybe because I'm not 15 years old, so I don't know what it's really like to have to go on Facebook and suffer FOMO or whatever. But it can't be the same as these other kinds of addictions we're talking about. But, but even the other kinds of addictions, you, you said in passing, uh, you can't will yourself out of it. You know, most people, most people do. The epidemic, Gene Heyman wrote a wonderful book called Addiction, a Disease of Choice. And he uh, provides all the uh, data from the epidemiological catchment area surveys over the years. People do. A lot of the average trajectory is to stop on one's own. And often because the wife is going to leave because, you know, you've got it, you've got hepatitis and, oh my God, what am I doing to myself? My kid hates me. Um, now, these days with fentanyl, it's it's so risky to wait. I mean, you're not going to sit around and for someone who's tw- 25 because uh, epidemiologically this is likely to happen in one, one's early 30s, is this kind of change. Um, you're not going to sit around. Well, I got five more years. We know, you know, if, you know, from statistically, actuarially, you'll probably grow out of it. It's too dangerous. That's absurd. And I, even without fentanyl, I wouldn't suggest waiting around. That's ridiculous. I'm just describing, you know, I'm just describing a trajectories uh, from a um, sort of a, um, a big big picture um, perspective. But uh, but still. Um, most people actually do stop on their own. The folks who have the most trouble and come to treatment are those with other uh, attendant psychiatric problems as as, as well. Um, so that's just worth knowing. I don't think most you know people do think that. And as you also said before, kind of like this Dr. Laura thing, which is uh, well, you're doing it right now. Um, when you uh, uh, read books, I mean, some of the best stuff on addiction is from the from uh, criminologists and um, epidemiologists, oh, sociologists, very descriptive, very granular, how people live their days. You make a million choices when you're, you know, addicted. Now, some people, granted, you, you know, the cinematic version is the one that you're going to see more of people who are shoot up enough to be, um, you know, passed out, nodded out, and then it wears off. And then they're in a mad hunt to find more drugs. And I'm not saying that that is not a version of what this can look like, but there are lots of versions of what it looks like. There are versions of it looking like I use heroin every day. And because I have access to a supply and it's, and it's a relatively safe one, 
And because my tolerance, meaning I don't need to have a higher and higher dose, is stable, I can stay, I could stay on that for years. Now we're not hearing about these people. They're not studied. They don't come in for help. Um, there's a million, there are right because uh, the spouse doesn't leave them. They, they don't lose their they don't lose their jobs and their life continues. No. So there is there is a very social element to it. Right. So I, a couple of personal experiences. So I, I've had a couple of hip replacements for which they gave me hydrocodone, which I really liked. Hydrocodone. Uh, I mean, it kind of energized me. It, it did knock back the pain a little bit. And I would just take half a pill because it, it did what it, I needed it to do. But I like it. I would just take it if I could, but I can't because they won't give it to me anymore. Uh, but but just because it kind of energizes me. I don't have an addictive personality. I took the little online uh, self-report surveys about that kind of thing. My father was an alcoholic. He died at age 61 as an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. One of his two brothers were an alcoholic. One of my two sisters, half-sisters, is an alcoholic. I just feel basically lucky that whatever it is about my physiology uh, is different than theirs. You know, when I drink, you know, I have a glass or two of wine or beer with dinner. I, you know, it's just I'm done. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I, if, you know, when the hydrocodone ran out, I wasn't like, oh, I got to get some more of that. It was like, oh, well, whatever. And but I don't feel like I have stronger willpower than my dad or my, one of my sisters. I, I just feel like, well, lucky me. I just don't have that physiology. Uh, and, and so there must be something in, in the difference between me and my father that it just, ha you know, like with Native Americans, they, they have a severe alcoholic, don't, don't they have a different physiology of processing alcohol in the liver or, or something like that? Well, I, and Asians I really can, know. yeah. So that, yeah, there's obviously oh, an yeah, interactive I, I'm not, effect. I, right. Oh yeah. I, I'm not arguing that there's that, 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 I mean, if, if you were the, if you, uh, got sick or in fact with a, in the Asian is has to do with alcohol uh, not being able to metabolize it well and, and then producing um, in the liver a talk a, a, a breakdown product of alcohol that's actually um, kind of toxic doesn't kill you but it makes you sick and flushy and all that very uncomfortable so you've got to have a bit of a permissive biology uh, there's no question that some people are find things more rewarding than others I happen to you know, yeah, I had some surgery. They give you Percocet. I immediately throw up, which is pretty common. I have no interest in it. So you're already, you know, on this. If, if there were a thousand steps on a scale to addiction, you're two steps higher than I am. But you've got, um, you've got so many now. And if maybe, if God forbid, well, we won't even use you as an example. But well, let's <laughs> imagine someone who's. family, you know, a whole bit just explode. They're all in an airplane, and oh my gosh, you know. You're the survivor. Your life has fallen apart. Well, maybe you would have said, "Hi, huh, I like that. And damn it, I'm going to keep getting it, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I... What's uh, the difference? What's the, let's talk about the difference between uh, liking and wanting something. Because I, I vaguely remember seeing something about this in addiction. It's not that the addict, it makes them feel good or they like it. It's that they have to have it or else sort of a negative reinforcement. Well, there are two, uh, yeah, people draw a distinction between liking it and um, sort of needing it. And, of course, the latter is associated more with uh, addiction, that subjective sense with addiction. Um, and there are two, again, probably more species of these, but two main species of, of, of wanting. Uh, one is the wanting that comes with, with withdrawal, so it starts to wear off. And, uh, you know, if you've taken it long enough, you'll have some withdrawal symptoms and um, it, where you start to feel very achy and uh, uh, you could start, you know, people vomiting and diarrhea. And it's, it's a, it can be very, very, very unpleasant, although few people die from opioid withdrawal. Not quite true of barbiturate and uh, alcohol withdrawal. Yeah. But uh, opioid withdrawal, I mean, unless you just have the most fragile heart in the world, you're probably not going to die from it. It's just, as they say, you might wish you would die, but you don't. Um, but then you you very much want it because that will quell your um, withdrawal. I mean, you're in withdrawal. The Whatever neuroadaptation uh, uh, was affected by the um, exposure to the drug and its occupancy on your receptors is gone. And now you're effectively physiologically overcompensating for that anyway. Um, and hence those symptoms, which are highly destruct 
not only the symptoms, I, I tend to think that one reason that people are so terrified of withdrawal is they're really terrified of not being able to get more drugs. And, um, you know, remember, there are two layers of misery here. There's the reason why you started using drugs, because I am a big fan of the self-medication hypothesis. So what, you know, what was the nature of the, the distress? It could take many forms, but it was powerful enough to make you say, well, hey, maybe the heck with my job. I still want to take this. So there's that, that primary layer of motivation to use and then get some relief. And then there's the whole secondary layer of the job you lost and the marriage you ruined and um, the reputation and maybe your health. And that is so, itself is so distressing that then you continue to take drugs to, not exp to feel the pain of physical and emotional pain of the destruction you caused. So that's why people are so ambivalent about stopping drugs. Um, but the, so, the, so that's, the other, that's the other wanting. I want so that I can feel better or not feel at all. And then the other, as we discussed, was the wanting to make the withdrawal symptoms go away. Okay, moving along on our lightning round here, I wanted to ask you about um, organ transplant markets because you've written a whole book about that. You are a recipient yourself. But also in the larger context, you know, kind of market solutions to various problems. Like what's wrong with the sex trade? What, what, why can't somebody uh, get paid to have sex? What's wrong with that? And, and I think it's almost in the same psychological category as organs. There's, there's something in our psychology you got the wrong about- organs. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but that, you know, that like pain for a body or a body part feels intuitively like that. That's not the right. That's a market exchange, and there's a place for that. But if we, but uh, like, I wouldn't pay my wife to make dinner for me. I mean, this, and I wouldn't go to a restaurant and then, and then in exchange for the the nice meal, invite the owner over to my house. He he wants to be paid, right? You know, or that that Woody Allen joke uh, about you know he holds his watch up and he goes on his on his deathbed. My grandfather sold me this watch. You know, <laughs> you know, it's just like. <laughs> No, no, there, there's, some, there's some things you just you can't put a price on it, right? Or asking, you know, in, in the Middle East, asking Palestinians or Israelis, all right, how much would you take to just give up the West Bank? Well, what, here's the checkbook. What's the number? And the answer is there is no number. This is sacred land. You can't put a price on this. Right. Well, we're all, you know, I, I'm always mentioning some, I, I mentioned somebody to read in the connect, connect, connection with all these topics so far, read Phil Tetlock on taboo trade-offs, um, and he'll walk you through, he's a brilliant man. Um, I really have the luxury, um, especially since it's a lightning round, but also because um, the organ thing is so big that that's, that's what I limit myself to. And unlike uh, prostitution, um, somebody lives at the end of it. And almost uh, unlike a lot of those kinds of things, which are almost, I mean, they're interesting, almost they're interesting, par interesting ethical parlor games, or you might discuss in a bioethics seminar, but God damn it, you know, 22 people are dying every day because they don't have an organ. And that's why I said, well, I don't really want to talk about your prostitutes. I want to talk about those folks, not your, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and there, Honestly, um, I mean, I'm part of a, a group of folks who are very, and Virginia Pastorell is one of us. In fact, uh, I don't know if you've had her on your show, but uh, no, she's, but um, oh yeah, she was, well, she used to edit Reason and um, a brilliant woman. Um, and uh, she was my kidney donor. And uh, so of course I conscripted, I didn't have to, her libertarian um, ethos would have immediately have um, predisposed her to the concept of rewarding people uh, who are willing to save your life. Um, you know, I didn't pay her. Uh, if I did, you know, I, and, and I announced it to the world, I could be carted off to jail. And I could, literally, that's the law, the National Organ Transplant Act of 1984. And she could be, we could share a cell um, because it would mean if, also if you, be if a you, felony. If you paid her. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Right, yeah. right. And, well, but 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 if I can just, just make it, a point, what 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 I what I'm going yeah. after here is is what you're up against is a, a kind of a deep psycho psychol psychological intuition that there's some things that the market should not be applied for. 
all libertarian oh, space. Yes, that, sure. You know, whether it's roads at the post office or, you know, police or military, you can't privatize that. There's certain, there's certain things you can't put a price on. That's what you're up against. I think. Well, we're definitely up against it. Um, Michael Sandel has a nice um, dichotomy. He, he calls, um, uh, he makes a distinction between consequence and corruption. So corruption, arguments from corruption are, are ontologic um, kinds of arguments, and it's basically just wrong or there's a which on what and on what underlies that often is i mean i guess unless you take a theological view that it's um ick you know there's just something wrong with monetizing especially since we've built up this whole um romance and i i hear i'm the poster girl for altruism for god's sakes i two kidneys from two earthbound saints but uh, you know we've romanticized altruism <laughs> as the only legitimate motive for giving an organ. Um, how about just informed consent from someone who feels that they could benefit, they and their family could benefit from a huge tax credit? Um, in fact, I have a whole plan if anyone wants it on how to work up this. Um, so I, a, a bunch of colleagues and I have literally been working since. My gosh, uh, over a decade to change the um, Organ Transplant Act uh, to at least experiment with incentives. And there is, we, there was a bill in Congress, and um, it actually, uh, uh, the, the let, let me ask you something. Why is that not a state's right? Sally, why is that not a state's right issue? Yeah. Well, because it's federal law, but but that's another um, option is for a state to hold a referendum on it. Uh, or to just pass, frankly, a, a law, and um, and then uh, you know go to the go to the Supreme Court over it. You know, just challenge challenge um, you know preemption on this. But there are so many good arguments for it because one thing, the problem is, um, and I've debated it. Ooh, so many folks on the other side. I mean, but when I get when I get a hold of some innocent, you know, a naive person who really hasn't thought about this very much. Um, first off, frankly, most people, you have to be an expert to have a problem with this. Uh, you should have to be a bioethicist to have a problem with it, or some some, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> some people in nephrology right. have a problem with it. But the average person, believe me, I never talk to people on public transportation since 1982, except to talk about this issue. Most people go, yeah. After I after I go through my spiel, which I'll go through quickly because it's the lightning round. Um, after I go through how it could work, um, they go, well, maybe there is something to that. Very few people have kind of held fast and said it's it's wrong. And I and for them, I say, well, could you tolerate the discomfort so that people could live? Could you tolerate that so that? I could save Michael's life and his son will have a dad and his wife will have a husband and, you know, I'll have a podcast to be on. Um, you know, could you could you do that? And, and, I, and I mean that in a sincere, not, not a cynical way. But here's my spiel, um, which is, first off, we're not talking about classic markets. Um, in fact, the libertarians might not even like my idea. And again, I don't take ownership of this. A lot of us have, have been pushing this general a model, which is um, be a third party, that would be the, if you want to use the word purchaser, and that probably be the government, although it could be some government designated entity. And the reward, uh, which we call reward, wouldn't call payment, you might call compensation, would not come in the form of cash, or at least a lump sum payment. It would come in in-kind benefit, like a tax credit, or life insur health insurance for the rest of your life, or loan forgiveness for your college, or you know, up to about 50. For some reason, people seem to think $50,000 sounds right. It just isn't. It's just, funny, everybody says, that. yeah, that sounds right. Um, <laughs> and, um, or, I, or I could offer it to you, but you can pass it on to a charity. So, uh, you know, that kind of, there, there are other, all other, you can imagine, other kinds of, kinds of arrangements you could imagine. So, Already you've, you've taken care of uh, two of the biggest qualms people have, which is, well, I couldn't afford a kidney. Why should you live? Because you can afford a kidney. Well, because we all can afford the kidney because we're not paying. So that's one thing. And, um, 
And the second thing is that um, people tend to get wor really worried that uh, you know, a poor person will rush into this kind of thing out of desperation and, and then regret it. And I think that's a reasonable thing to bring up. I mean, people bring up reasonable objections, except that we have answers for all of them, which is to say, well, we'll build in uh, a cooling off period effectively, which is you have to wait a year to do it. Uh, of course, there's informed consent. And even when you sign on the dotted line, no one's going to come after you and strap you down to an operating table. Well, you said you'd give it. So of course, you could back out <laughs> at any time. But um, And we're not offering what a desperate person wants, which is immediate cash. So, so kind of that takes care of that problem. You could build in a, an income uh, floor. In other words, you have to earn uh, twice the poverty level to even participate, which I'm not a fan of because I think even poor people can make decisions in their own best interest. But um, uh, but that's the thing people, at least in the arguments from corruption, and that's the con that, that would be the utilitarian view. It's like, what do you think could go wrong? It's not that it's wrong in and of itself. It just could go wrong. So what could go wrong? A poor person could rush into it and regret it. Well, okay because they're so desperate. Well, fine, we'll build in protections so that that won't happen. And then the people really, most people go, oh yeah, well, you know, that kind of makes sense. And again, the stakes are so huge because it, it is truly life and death and it's such unnecessary death. And, you know, I have, um, um, I have written about this, so I, mean, I really effectively have no family. I know this sounds a little pitiful, but <laughs> you know, that could have been in a position to give me a kidney. And so, as I said, thank God, you know, Virginia came around at the last minute and it was only because she ran into a mutual friend who, uh, Virginia said, how's Sally? And they said, eh, she needs a kidney. And then Virginia, that started the process. But wow. I had, um, as do many people, a really, um, listen, I wasn't scared about the surgery or scared about any of this. The, the scary part is, are you ever going to get one? Because dialysis, which granted keeps you alive, although always premature death is guaranteed, but at least it's there. If my liver was shot and I didn't get a liver, I'd be dead. So I'm, you know, but, um, but I had a lot of people turn me down and, you know, what do you say? Well, okay, I get it. It's a lot to ask, yes, you know, of yes, um, right. and people <laughs> back out at the last minute. It's not fun. So um, listen, Michael, in, in 30 years, when your kid is, when your kid has kids, if we're not using pig kidneys by then, I will be stunned. If we don't have uh, a heart that was somehow printed or, you know, or yes, fill in the blank right. or somehow print, engineered or printing. cloned. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this will happen. This is the future of transplants. People will look back on what, you know, we're talking about and think how barbaric or not, you know, primitive that people had to actually give organs. So this is a time-limited problem, but we've got but enough years yet. to go and enough avoidable deaths that we have to act. What's the asymmetry between how many are available and how many need it in the United States? Well, there are about 100,000 people who need all, uh, no, kidneys, and 120,000 people who need all organs. And the reason there are so many people who need kidneys, listen, hearts fail much more than kidneys fail. But, um, but dialysis can keep people alive. Um, so there are 100,000 on the list, and maybe 27,000 will be transplanted this year. Yes, Excuse I me, 120,000. I'm in California, so we have an opt-in uh, system where I punch the little tab on my driver's license that, you know, should I be killed, I'll, you can take my organs. Apparently, or Oregon does an opt-out. You are given your organs. When you get your driver's license, and then you have to punch the tab. Is that true? You don't want to. I think I should, so. I should uh, know that. It, I didn't think any it, state had opt out. I think anyway, so. I could be I, wrong. Uh, 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 I don't know. I'll look it up. Uh, yeah, I could be wrong too. But in any case, it, but I, I always like that example is the opt in, opt out. Here's that that kind of choice it's still architecture not enough, though, things you know? that governs. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, but yeah. it's still. Yeah, it's still. It, I mean, whatever. It's fine. But the the pro the only problem with opt out. Excuse me. Yeah. It, it, whether Oregon does it or not, the only problem with it as a concept is that people think it's enough. Not you, not you, but a lot of people think that's the answer, mm. and it, it wouldn't yeah. be the answer. 
might help no. around the margin. Now we have or chains of uh, um, actually Al Roth, who's at Stanford, probably close. You do you live in San near uh, Stanford? No, no, no. I'm down south. I'm in Santa Barbara. Oh, okay. Anyway, brilliant double Nobel Prize winning economist Al Roth um, had devised uh, um, kidney chains so that you get two two people. Let's say you wanted to give me a kidney, but you were the wrong blood type, and um, so we would assemble like ten people who didn't match, but you match with somebody else's potential donor, and I match with. And it's complicated mathematically, and now. Um, the medication and the immunology has gotten so sophisticated that my, I had mentioned I've gotten two kidneys. The second one was from someone who was B, uh, type B um, blood, and I had, Virginia and I had type A. So they can even overcome with some plasmapheresis uh, that discrepancy. So they're making advances, but the real advance is getting more organs, you know? Well, look how, how quickly we responded to the uh, need for vaccines. And so maybe if if, you know, like millions of Americans instead of 100,000, if maybe 20 million or 50 million needed organs, uh, you know, there'd be enough government money to fund that research to speed up that process of 3D printing your organs. or something like that. I know it's coming. I, I don't think it's going to come in my lifetime. <laughs> and But I'm really counting on a lot of these young, you know, smart young people to, to get cracking before us baby boomers hit the wall, like on Alzheimer's. And dementia, you know, I don't want to lose my mind. <laughs> so, all right, Sally, this has been great. We are uh, just one final observation from you. We're two years now into the pandemic. We've had a lot of different experiments run, different states do different things. And what's your sense as a medical doctor, given the caveats that you're not an epidemiologist and so forth, uh, and you're not Anthony Fauci having to give public advice, but just your thoughts on uh, you know, should we have closed down sooner or not at all? What should we do now? What just kind of give your general uh, opinions of how it's should been going? Have, should have escaped while I was ahead with the kidneys. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> I, I remember thinking three months into the whole thing that we we're probably going to look back and realize we really overreacted with the uh, so much of the lockdown, but, but believe me at the time I wasn't in a position to second guess. And I had a lot of sympathy for everyone who was, uh, taking perhaps over precautions. Uh, look, I think there have been enough postmortems with the testing and CDCs, the CDCs, uh, problems. Um, uh, so <laughs> if you ask me about the future, I don't know how well we're learning lessons. I mean, it's just know, shocking that the, the, the uh, tests aren't out. Um, I don't really, I mean, I'm not going to criticize the head of the CDC. Um, I, it's so hard to know. I mean, we, we don't really know what goes on, but um, uh, I just worry about, you know, we'll, we'll put Scott Golly back in. I mean, he was FDA, but um, he's my also my colleague at AEI, but um, uh, it's the future really. I mean, that's, that's where the, I think a lot of the money is and getting, pa I don't know why or how hard it is to get all these doses of Pax, uh, Lovid. I know that, um, they're cranking it out, but there are shortages there. You'd have to know where in the pipeline the kink was and how could we have foreseen that? And the same with the, do you know, no monoclonal antibodies even work against Omicron. So, and there is a new one and it is in the pipeline, but even in, in a very imminent pipeline, but even when that comes out, it's not um, going to be uh, available. And we may be, but this is the first time we really may do that rationing in a, in a real capital R rationing way. All right. What's your next book? What are you working on now? I know you're always writing something. Oh, um, well, I'm, what I'm doing is read, believe it or not, I'm reading this book uh, on called Empire of Pain by Patrick Rev, uh, Patrick Radenkeefe, who's a you know, very, very uh, excellent writer. The book is pretty compelling. It's all about the Sacklers and Purdue. And I'm reading it in order to find out because he's meticulous and he um, it doesn't give them a break on any, you know, everything they do wrong, he will cap, he will have documented and caught. So I think if anything, he's overzealous, which is good because I want to know absolutely everything they are accused of 
And, and they're accused of, and they, um, from what I understand, have done, have a lot to account for, perhaps enough corporate malfeasance to ha- to be driven out of, well, the company is in bankruptcy, um, uh, deservedly so. But I want to know everything, and then I'm going to run it by four people I know who are, you know, really involved and find out what what was, you know, what's fair, what's not quite fair. Um, oh, nice. Good. I, I mean... I don't want to keep going, but I can just give you one example where they talk about they advertise OxyContin as being less addictive. Well, all things being equal, a slow acting psychoactive drug will be less addictive, will be less, uh, will have less abuse potential. That is a true fact. Um, but that's portrayed as one of their lies. And well, it's complicated. But OxyContin was always schedule two in the DEA schedule. You know, two being one being heroin and LSD, having technically no medical. That's going to have to change, I think, at some point. Yes, Marijuana is in there. Yes. It's right. Schedule two being the, the most um, um, potentially addictive of all the, you know, codeine, I think, being five, it goes up to five, um, five being the weakest. But it was schedule two. Um, hmm. Doctors have to, I mean, that's. Kind of one on one pharmacology schedule two. Right. A drug rep tells you it's not addictive. So anyway, that's what I'm doing right now. That sounds good. Well, that's very current. All right, good place to end there, Sally. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so You're much. One of the-